theoretical videos in this lecture series on genotype. The fact is that to be a good farmer, from what I've noticed, you really don't need to know much about genetics. I remember chatting with a very successful farmer, and he attributed his success in the relatively dry 2020 growing season to planting a, a variety of corn that was drought tolerant. And he said it was drought tolerant because it had a gene from a cactus in it. Now that's wrong in about eight different ways, uh, but he's still a very successful, very innovative and progressive farmer. So I say this with respect, but you clearly don't need to know very much about the science of genetics or biotechnology to be successful. But having a bit of background can make you a more discerning customer and prevent you from being misled by erroneous marketing claims. A couple of important points. First, complex traits are not under the control of a single gene. Something like drought tolerance is controlled or regulated by a whole number of genes. And the expression of these genes itself is regulated by, guess what? Yes, environment and management factors. So marketing materials that advertise this variety has a, a yield gene or a drought tolerance gene, that is incorrect. The exception here, as you might be thinking, are traits like BT or herbicide tolerance. These are actually relatively simple traits because it's under the control of a single gene. This next point comes directly from crop readers at the big seed companies themselves. They will say that the current breeding paradigm is focused on figuring out genotypes that have high yields consistently across a range of environments, different locations and different years. They want high consistent yields. Only then, once genotypes pass that very high selection pressure, only then uh, is their management optimized. What that means is that varieties are not bred for specific management styles, you know, to do really well in certain soil textures or seeding rates or what have you. There might be varietal differences, for different varieties might respond to management differently, but that is serendipitous. It's not really, it happens after the fact. It's not like a, a breeding target, okay, because management is generally held constant at the selection level. This means it's up to farmers and agronomists to tailor variety selection to a particular management style or vice versa, how to adjust management to optimize variety performance. Your past biology and genetics classes probably put DNA and genes at the center of biological life. Again, using this DNA as computer program. Uh, but here's a couple of facts you probably did not learn in those classes. You can, one can enucleate uh, living cells, that is take out the, the DNA and then see how they behave. There's a couple of things cells can do even without DNA, for example, cell division. This suggests that certain cellular functions evolved before the evolution of DNA. Moreover, there's convincing evidence that phenotype is not necessarily connected to genotype, even in very controlled environments where, where we would say environment and management is held constant. And there's a cool study in fish uh, that illustrate this point. These scientists took a fertilized goldfish egg, all right? So after, you know, sperm fertilized this egg cell, they enucleated this goldfish egg. They took out the nucleus, they removed the DNA and replaced it with the nucleus from a different fish, a carp, a carp nucleus, uh, or the nucleus from a carp egg cell. Okay, so this is kind of a mad, mad scientist kind of crazy experiment. The goldfish egg uh, with the carp nucleus in it. And they grew this egg cell to maturity. They created a hybrid fish. So remember, this is a goldfish egg cell with no goldfish DNA. All the DNA was removed and it's just carp DNA. However, in the hybrid fish at the adult stage, certain phenotypic traits were inherited from the goldfish and not the carp. For example, the number of backbones, the number of vertebrae, that trait was inherited from the goldfish which again, remember, did not provide any DNA. The point here is that DNA, genes, cannot fully explain phenotype. Even at the cellular level, even in a controlled environment, you know, the lab growing some goldfish and carpfish, even in those controlled contrived conditions, DNA cannot explain everything. And so when we go to a system as complex as a farm field, we have to keep in mind that genotype 
has an important role to play. It's obviously important, but it cannot explain everything. Apologies for going on a bit of a tangent there. Let's return back to cropping systems. Let's first start with the first one, yield potential. So this is the genetic yield potential of a crop when grown in non-limiting conditions. So we're not imposing any um, nutrient stress, abiotic stress, or biotic stress. We're allowing the genetic yield potential its fullest expression. And we can estimate genetic yield potential uh, by looking at yields, record yields from yield, co yield contest winners. For example, non-irrigated corn yield contest winners typically get yields around 300 and 400 bushels per acre. That contrasts with what is in Ontario average on farm corn yields of about 170 bushels per acre. That means there's clearly a yield gap between what's achieved on farm and what's, what's possibly achieved with today's genetics. Of course, the implication is that there's environment and management factors that are reducing uh, actual yields below genetic yield potential. Yield stability is a genotype-specific trait that measures, as the word implies, how yield varies across environments. And environments, again, is just a scientific $5 word for growing season. So how does yield change over growing seasons? Is yield stable or is, it, is yield unstable? Now, there's two different measurements of yield stability. There's static stability and dynamic stability. And farmers and breeders typically use different definitions. Most people think of yield stability in the static sense. That is that across growing seasons, a variety that is highly yield stable is just going to yield the same each and every growing season. So in really stressful growing seasons, in really you know favorable growing seasons, yield basically the same. That's a yield stable variety. Static yield stability is what we would call an absolute measurement. So it doesn't really depend on the yield of anything else other than the variety under question. And you can measure static yield stability, for example, by calculating the coefficient of variation or standard deviation of yield across different growing seasons. Dynamic yield stability is a little bit tougher to define because it's a relative measurement of stability. You can only calculate the dynamic stability of a variety in relation to or relative to other uh, varieties grown in that same variety trial. So if you did a variety trial over many years, you would have some years that were low yielding, stressful, some years that were medium, and some years that were high yielding, uh, favorable growing seasons. And you can see an example of, of that on the right, uh, this figure from Leslie's paper. A dynamically stable variety is going to have close to average yields in every one of those environments or growing seasons. And that means that its stability is, is defined in relation to the trial average, what other varieties are yielding. We can define stability, either static or dynamic, mathematically by looking at the or calculating the slope of the line of a graph, like you see here, grain yield as a function of environmental index. And so uh, it's, it's possible to define stability mathematically. We won't do that in this class, but it's going to be important for you to be able to look at a graph like this one, look at the slope of the line, not calculate anything, but tell me, is this a dynamic uh, or static uh, stability variety? Another point is that yield stability has nothing to do with yield level, right? You can have a variety with consistent yield of zero, a consistent yield of, you know, a thousand bushels per acre, those varieties will have the same static yield stability, basically perfect yield stability with zero deviation or uh, variation. And so st stability of yield does not have anything to do with the actual yield. Variety selection is one of the more difficult decisions that farmers face. They have to make this decision every year and especially for a crop like corn or soybeans, it's a major financial investment. And so seed companies uh, obviously try to convince farmers, they try to market to farmers to buy, to buy their product. Okay? And, and so one of the uh, ways that seed is marketed, corn seed especially, is that these varieties are placed as 
racehorse varieties or workhorse varieties or aggressive and defensive varieties. And the value add for the farmer is that they can choose these select a variety based on things like, you know, their fields yield potential or the, their management style. So there's no obvious or I should say well-defined definition of what a racehorse or workhorse variety is. But from what I understand, you know, a racehorse kind of corn hybrid is one that has very high yield potential and it does well on your best land and responds to intensive high input management. Uh, however, it cannot handle stress as well. Your uh, workhorse or defensive variety or hybrid uh, handles different kinds of stress as well, but does not have top end yield potential. So we just talked about yield stability, static and dynamic. And this distinction between workhorse and racehorse varieties kind of jives with this idea, right? You can have your racehorse varieties with low yield stability. They either do really well or really poorly. And a workhorse that is very stable, it, it kind of yields consistently uh, across different environments. So there is at first glance scientific evidence to support this distinction versus racehorse and workhorse varieties. But it could also just be used as a post hoc explanation. For example, if a variety performs poorly, someone can come by and say, well, you know, that variety is more of a racehorse. Uh, so let's use some science to critically evaluate see if there's a scientific uh, basis for this racehorse versus workhorse distinction. Keep in mind that yield stability is not necessarily desirable from the perspective of the farmer. Say you have genotype 1 and 2, and genotype 1 overperforms in certain kinds of growing seasons. Well, genotype 1 would be considered less lower yield stability, right, because its yield is more variable than genotype 2, but a farmer would always pick genotype 1 because it yields just as well as genotype two in two of the three environments, and genotype one yields better in one of the three. So this racehorse genotype one, lower yield stability, would always be the best decision. The next thing to keep in mind is that for this distinction between workhorse and racehorse varieties to be valid, there must be a trade-off between yield stability and yield potential and also between yields in favorable and unfavorable or stressful environments. So here we have an example where there is a trade-off between yield stability and potential. Genotype number two has consistent stable yields across all environments. Genotype one has much higher yields in this high environmental index, so a favorable growing season, but much lower yields in the low and medium environmental index, and we can just call those stressful years. And so in this case, there's a clear trade-off. A farmer needs to make a decision between what kind of variety that they, need, they want to plant. In this scenario, uh, yield is always higher in genotype 1, although yield is always more stable in genotype 2. So for a farmer, no matter what the environmental index is or whatever that growing season happens to be, they're always better off selecting genotype 1. A couple of final points here. So a workhorse hybrid may be resilient against one kind of stress, uh, but not another. So looking at very wet versus very dry seasons, you might have a very yield stable variety, but uh, very cold versus very warm seasons, that same hybrid could be a racehorse doing really well in one of those kinds of warm versus colder seasons. Okay, so, so there's a bit more complexity there when you think about it. Uh, number two is that by their own admission, modern breeding programs uh, operated by large, the large seed companies, they really focus on optimizing G by E interactions. They're not focused on M. And so they're not looking at how do different varieties respond to intensive management versus low input kind of management at the breeding selection stage. So they're selecting primarily for hybrids that do well in a range of different environments, different growing seasons, different locations. And once they advance those varieties, then they're optimizing management. They're not looking at varieties that do well in a particular kind of management system. They're essentially holding that management factor constant at the selection level. There's no pre-breeding strategy. Finally, uh, we need to distinguish between selecting for greater yields and greater genetic yield potential. 
Okay, so uh, the difference between genetic yield potential as found in yield contest winning fields is so much higher than uh, yield on farm that just trying to increase genetic yield potential, you know, assuming you could you could do that, is not is not necessarily going to increase on farm yields. What breeders are doing, uh, in fact, is increasing stress tolerance of newer hybrids. They're they're breeding uh, varieties that don't have quote unquote higher genetic yield potential, but they can maintain that potential against better against stresses like uh, uh, water limitations or increasing seedling vigor to deal with stresses like cold soils around planting. So it's entirely possible that we have a distinction, a real distinction between racehorse and workhorse varieties because workhorse varieties have these um, increased tolerance to stresses. Uh, but this, but, but whatever is physiologically causing this increase in stress tolerance, whatever that crop is doing, maybe it's growing deeper roots uh, or having a thicker leaf cuticle to deal with drought stress, uh, or maybe it's just using a lot more of its seed reserves to emerge and it doesn't have as much energy to uh, photosynthesize initially. And so there's a bit of a delay in its growth once it emerges. I'm just making this up for the sake of argument, but there's um, th those, those physiological responses, you know, it, it's energetically costly. And so that crop is spending energy and losing yield in growing seasons where that stress is absent because it's, you know, whatever it's doing to, for stress tolerance, let's say growing deeper roots, uh, that is going to reduce yield in growing seasons where, you know, soils are warm around planting or in wet growing seasons where it doesn't need deep root. Anyway, this all brings us back to the original point, which is that for the distinction between racehorse and workhorse hybrids to be valid, there has to be a trade-off uh, between yield potential and yield stability. In 2002, University of Guelph corn breeder Liz Lee and corn physiologist Tice Tolinar tested this idea that it's worthwhile for someone to distinguish between racehorse and workhorse varieties when selecting a variety to grow. Their hypothesis that there was actually, in fact, no relationship between yield potential and yield stability, either a positive or negative relationship. And so this workhorse versus racehorse distinction wasn't all that useful. What they did was they took hundreds of yield data points from around the USA um, from, from large variety trials but they only focused on looking at varieties that were used uh, by yield contest winners. So essentially they took those varieties that yield contest winners used, they looked for those varieties in large data sets of variety trials, and they calculated both yield potential and yield stability. So the authors calculated dynamic yield stability as opposed to static yield stability. And you can see a visual representation of their hypothesis here. So they took the variety trial average yield and they plotted the slope of that, right? The average variety trial yield in different environments, uh, high yielding and low yielding uh, site years. And then for individual varieties, they compared the slope of how yield changes with environment to the variety trial average. So varieties that have, have a much steeper slope compared to the variety trial average, those are racehorse varieties. In low yielding years, they do much worse than average. In high yielding years, they do much better than average. Uh, and, and varieties that have a shallower slope than variety trial average are workhorse varieties. Uh, more stable yields, they yield a bit higher than average in low yielding environments, and they yield lower than average in high yielding environments. So their hypothesis looked like this, that there were varieties that were more higher yielding and also more stable than uh, the trial average. So in red, you see this workhorse variety, more stable yields across environments, but also higher yields across environments. So what these authors did is they calculated the slope of uh, yield across different environments. In other words, they calculated the dynamic yield stability of varieties and, and also its average yield. So what did the researchers find? Well, when they looked at the varieties used by yield contest winners in the un United States and Canada, they found that those varieties were more workhorse than racehorse. 
Those varieties had high yield stability across different environments, but also really good yield potential. They also found that modern elite hybrids do vary in terms of yield stability. So there are varieties that are more stable in terms of their yield. Uh, however, they found no evidence that yield stability and yield potential are mutually exclusive. There are varieties out there that have high yield stability and high yield potential, so you can have it all. Now, this is not to say that there are not important G by M interactions. For example, there might be some hybrids that do better at higher seeding rates or planting densities than others. Uh, but but and the and you got to figure that out. But the point is that. Um, these varietal responses to different management practices has nothing to do with yield stability or yield potential. There are other traits involved uh, in creating those genetic responses to management. Central to understanding G by E interactions is the concept of phenotypic plasticity, which is the definition of environmentally contingent trait expression. So we can think of any crop trait, be that yield, rooting depth, leaf area, as being regulated by the environment as well as the genotype. And the more phenotypically plastic a trait is, the more that trait is regulated, it, its expression governed by the environment. Crop traits that are stable from season to season and aren't very much affected by things like weather, those traits would not be considered phenotypically plastic. They would be primarily regulated by the genotype as opposed to the environment. Now, hopefully you understand how the concept of phenotypic plasticity can be related to either static yield stability or dynamic yield stability. And this is something you should be knowing for uh, future assessments in this course. A good example of a trait that's phenotypically plastic is rooting depth and root length of cereal crops like corn or wheat. Those crops generally respond to drought stress or nutrient stress by increasing rooting depth and branching out, exploring more soil, basically creating longer, uh, more branching roots. They, there's an obvious reason why a crop would do that, right? Well, hey, um, I'm under water stress or I need more nitrogen, so you know, let's invest more in those root structures to, to find some, uh, some, some of these nutrients. But maintaining those sensory pathways that detect, you know, hey, drought stress is occurring or, hey, nutrient stress is happening, you know, that, that pathway is energetically costly to the plant. The plant has to manufacture hormones and maintain specialized cellular structures for this phenotypic plasticity to occur, for, for there to be a way to understand or sense its environment. And that might not be rational, quote unquote, from the plant's perspective, if for example, it's, it knows it's always going to be grown in a dry environment. You know, why maintain those pathways to say, hey, is this a dry or wet growing season if it's almost always going to be dry? It might make more sense for that crop to have evolved a specialized root system to always branch very deeply, a root very deeply with a highly branched system because it quote unquote knows uh, via evolution, that it's almost always going to experience dry conditions. So might as well specialize for those environments and not really invest in the sensory network. The root system of sorghum is an example of a more specialized root system in their case, or in that case, specialized for dry environments. Sorghum evolved in an uh, arid area of Africa. And so its root system is generally always more deeply rooting, always more branching, it's specialized in those dry environments. Even if it's grown today in an irrigated system, its root structure is going to be, is adapted or specialized to those drier environments. And it's going to be less phenotypically plastic in response to water supply. So we can express phenotypic plasticity mathematically by calculating the slope of the reaction norm. In other words, relating the change in phenotype in the case uh, of the what you see here, that's leaf expansion rate, uh, as environment changes. In this case, it's change in vapor pressure deficit. Uh, this looks a lot like how we would calculate yield stability, and, and it's almost the same thing. It basically actually is the same thing. It's the uh, rate of change of that yield or other phenotypic trait over environment, growing seasons, or in this case, VPD. I'm not gonna ask you in this class to actually calculate the reaction norm, 
uh, mathematically, but you'll need to be able to look at a graph like the one you're seeing here and be able to tell me, uh, you know, is genotype one uh, or, or two or three the most phenotypically plastic for this trait? Uh, and so you need to be able to interpret these kind of graphs.